A new workplace model has arrived, a model that puts workers first. You have infinite potential for growth. Don't let it go to waste. Flexible hours, stylish uniform, free balanced meals and comfortable living conditions, an opportunity to work in an energetic, friendly team and advance in your career, a dedication to providing equal opportunities to all, and of course, generous compensation for your labor. You will not find a better place to work. Choose success today. And don't look back. Right, there you go. If you're watching this, I'm... Uh, nah, you know what? Scrap that. No melodrama. Welcome to my hiding place, I guess. Just had a job interview that went a little too well. Some mixed feelings about this position need some time to think things over. Actually, I'm not sure I get a say. Right, I'm still filming, aren't I? I hate awkward silences. No more conversation topics, Matthew. Weather? Work? Netflix, maybe? That Squid Game show is having a bit of a moment right now, isn't it? Have you watched it already? Squid Game is a survival drama produced by Netflix South Korea and written and directed entirely by its creator, Hon Dung Young. The show is about a dystopian version of a game contest in which several hundred people, all desperately in need of money, can either win billions of won or get shot in the head. Typical um, reality TV drama. And yes, it is definitely having a moment. Less than a month from its release, it has already become Netflix's most watched show of all times. Not bad for a series that was written more than 10 years ago and deemed unworthy of funding by multiple production companies. The central themes of the Squid Game are not buried underneath the quick-paced thrill. The show is about poverty, class divide and the horrors of late-stage capitalism. And yes, it is a brutal, exaggerated metaphor, yet the story somehow manages to be viscerally realistic. Maybe not to everyone, but definitely to my fellow terminally online folks who are regularly exposed to these sort of headlines. The show is no joke. It is well written, ruthless, tense, and cut wrenching, and somehow still manages to be touching and tender in certain moments. Official review score of a very picky consumer of media, Chef's Kiss. Now, I probably don't need to go into detail on how the Squid Game is criticizing class disparity and capitalism. For one, it's kind of obvious, and two, there are some videos out there already doing it anyway, links in the description. But just as a recap, for those who maybe haven't seen it and aren't planning to, we've got desperate people who are coerced into fighting to death for money in a system they supposedly consented to, twice, and are managing to approach it like any other job, complaining about work conditions and sexual harassment while their identity is reduced to a number, the boss is encouraging them to literally murder their competition, and their supervisors, who are just as fucked as they are, happily exercise lethal power over them. 
At the same time, the boss somehow thinks the deal is fair and equal, as we are shown all the reasons why the contestants were forced into this situation, including the main character recounting violent protests at his job that ended with one of his co-workers dying and eventually with him losing the job anyway. Yeah, there's a lot. A more subtle metaphor I've noticed in this show is the video game aesthetic. And no, this has nothing to do with mass shootings. Violent video games do not make people more violent. Shut the fuck up. What I mean is, the squid game goes heavy on the game part. And it's not just about the actual structure of it, it's also the soundtrack. and the set design and these symbols on soldier masks. I'm not the only one seeing PlayStation joystick here, right? It's very possible that this is an allure to reality game contests, but it did make me think of one thing. Anyone else has a feeling that our current economic system is one long cash grab of a video game with no option of deleting it? As a language nerd, I spend a lot of time thinking over various noises that humans make with their mouths. One curious word is grind. It used to mean reducing something to powder, and now means hard dull work. That second meaning originated in gaming communities, specifically in mass multiplayer online RPGs but has since been adopted by many others, like people in the self-employed hustle communities, for example. What grinding is, in video games at least, is some repetitive boring task that you have to do over and over, sometimes for hours a day, in order to receive some in-game reward. And if you've never experienced it yourself, you might think, hey, that sounds bloody ridiculous. Why would any sane person waste their precious limited time on this planet to play a game they aren't even enjoying? And you would be right. Except it happens all the damn time. From a point of view of a game designer, the benefit is obvious. Dull, time-consuming tasks keep the player on the platform and looking at the ads, or encourage them to spend real money to avoid it. In either case, the result is easy profit. From a point of view of a game player, it's a tad more complicated. Basically, we are victims of our own psychology. My experience with the grind... No, no not that grind, though I, I have experience with it too. Anyway, I used to play Marvel Contest of Champions a lot. It is an MMO game that you can technically play entirely for free. Technically. In reality, the further you progress, the more resources you need. And the only two ways of getting them is either paying real money or dedicating multiple hours of your day to very easy and very boring game fights. There are many ways in which MCUC exploits human psychology, including gambling mechanics and peer pressure, and the fan community is very aware of it. I remember watching MCOC streams that were more salt than gameplay, with a constant supply of pay-to-win memes. And yet everyone still did it. Including me. Everyone knew that if you wanted to play the game, you could either accept the rules and keep grinding, or quit. I don't remember how long I was into MCUC. I was never a high level player, but I was pretty decent. I was like deep into the law and strategy. I was in lineup groups, watching multiple streams a week, making Excel spreadsheets and checking the game every one to two hours every single day. A lot of it was grinding, but some was actually really fun. And if you've ever forced yourself through a severely dull task, like sorting your entire garage or something, you know the feeling of relief and accomplishment that comes after completing it. 
Sometimes in life you just have to stick through the dull work to have fun afterwards. Also, you get used to it. You settle into a routine of grinding for hours a day and it stops feeling weird. All your gamer buddies are doing it, all the streamers you watch are doing it, so what gives? Of course, eventually I got to a point where I was setting alarm clocks for myself in the middle of the night to wake up and do a little bit more grinding and that's when I realized, hold on a second, what the fuck am I doing? Also, not gonna lie, I just stopped caring about the game that much. I reached the ceiling of both my own skill and my phone's processing power and I was playing out of habit. Then one day I simply did not turn the game on in the morning and never came back. The neuropsychological reason behind grinding is this little chemical called dopamine. Remember his face, because technically speaking, this is the only thing any of us actually enjoys. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that is released in the brain as a reward for participating in one of the four F's of evolution. Fighting, fleeing, feeding, and mating. Dopamine isn't really a pleasure molecule as much as it is a motivation molecule. In other words, dopamine is what steers and modifies our behavior, and attunes it for survival and reproduction. And that can be food or sex, sure, but it can also be relief from danger, or completion of a task, or social approval. Basically anything that the brain perceives as important. The full range of dopamine function is long and mostly irrelevant to this whole infodump. The relevant thing is that dopamine is also responsible for addiction. The effect is so intense that you can predict a strong tendency for addiction just by looking at someone's dopamine receptor genes. Addictions happen when your reward and motivation system is hacked, either directly, like by cocaine, or indirectly, like by junk food, or sex, or gambling, or shopping, or even productivity. I'm not the only one who just loves the feeling of crossing things from a to-do list, right? I think when people talk about the addictive aspects of video games, they focus a little bit too much on the gambling mechanics, you know, loot crates and such. And there is definitely an element of that. Wait. Oh, look, Amazon promo code. Right, what was I saying? Right, the mystery box thing. It is legit, but it's not the entire picture. There are plenty of games that don't have mystery boxes and still have grind mechanics. It works because, generally speaking, people enjoy getting things done. We like when the number goes up, we like when the progress bar says 100, we enjoy completing levels and beating the boss and going up in ranks. All of this stems from our evolutionary history. Like any other species, we developed in a dangerous environment in which most things we need for survival were constantly lacking and competition was brutal. Sure, members of our own tribe were there to help, but having a family does not guarantee an abundance of food and safety from predators. We evolved in fight mode. We needed to sometimes be greedy, sometimes violent, and very stubborn in getting shit done. I mean, our main hunting strategy was chasing a wounded animal for hours until it collapses from exhaustion. We sure needed a fuck ton of dopamine to survive. And video game danger or scarcity are not real, but the brain does not know that. The brain just accepts the grind. When you think about it in dopamine terms, the hustle culture grind is not so different from the video game grind. Apart from obvious ways in which you can gamify work, such as productivity apps with RPG mechanics, collecting productivity stats and generally fixating on progress numbers, 
there is something deeper at play here. An insatiable drive to succeed, the competitive aspect and the feeling of superiority over traditionally employed people, the satisfaction of persevering through week after week of meaningless, joyless work, all in anticipation of a potentially enormous reward that might never arrive. Now, when I'm talking about the hustle, I'm not including the people who have to work multiple jobs and participate in the gig economy just to make ends meet. If that's you, I feel for you and I think you deserve so much better. Now, in this case, I'm talking about the people who have their needs more or less fulfilled and still find themselves taking on extra work for whatever reason. And it doesn't just apply to self-employed hustlers. People with traditional office jobs routinely work over time and bring their work home to stay productive on the weekends. The grind trap is everywhere. There are many reasons why people find themselves caught in a perpetual cycle of overworking. For one, there is an enormous societal pressure to succeed, to be productive at all costs and to keep earning more and improving. Workplaces trick people into thinking that the extra effort they put in will reap benefits in the future. Gig jobs and self-employment opportunities promise the reward of in independence and financial freedom. Consumerism is a never-ending cycle too. Purchase dopamine dissipates quickly and we are surrounded by so many ads that make us feel like we are always lacking something. Both the worker class and the capital owner class are slaves to productivity and progress. The workers are always trying to earn more so that they can buy more and eventually break into the owner class. Meanwhile, the owner class feels like they can never slow down and relax, either because they will be outcompeted or simply because they're addicted to seeing the numbers on their bank accounts go up. The stock market is a gambling arena. Your fellow workers or business owners are your perpetual game competition. And the way to promotion of the Forbes richest person list is a slow, aggravating climb. And it's so easy to join the game without even realizing it. I experienced this firsthand during my first semester of grad school. It was a pretty happy period of my life and I often find myself missing it, even though I understand now how messed up it was. At the time, I was studying around 70 hours a week. I was on campus 5 days a week, often from 8am to 5pm, and sometimes from 8am to 8pm. Every day I was waking up at 5.30 in the morning and going to bed at 9. On weekends, I would get out of bed, grab a cup of coffee and immediately sit down to study. My entire life was grad school. I used to keep multiple bullet journals and track my progress in multiple apps. I had an average grade of 4.92 out of 5, all while being chronically ill and autistic. Why was I enjoying it so much? Well. For one, I love my subject and I can clearly see the purpose of my work. It's not some bullshit gig that I'm doing just for money. Also, I was lucky to end up with a great research group in a great university and both my teachers and classmates were wonderful. Humans love the sense of unity and camaraderie. We get hooked on getting through difficulties together. But if I said that was all, I'd be lying. The truth is, 70 hour work weeks are great at covering shit up. They mask whatever unfulfilled need or life dissatisfaction you have and replace it with a very addictive feeling of being a successful hard worker. Academics work for imaginary numbers too, for points, for citations, for grades and institute assessments. You work so hard and so often you can shut off any other problem, just like a person addicted to a video game. But it doesn't fix anything. When the pandemic hit and I was suddenly alone with my thoughts, I had the worst identity-slash-existential crisis of my entire life. 
and I came out on the other end with a very different work ethic. The main danger of having your psychology hacked by the grind, both in video games and in real life, is that it makes you lose sight of the actual gameplay. So many game developers have figured out how to hook players, they don't even need to think about making enjoyable content. And so many of us, me included at one point, get so caught up in chasing achievements that we start to forget just how pathetically short our lives are. Research shows that what people regret the most at the end of their life is not spending enough time with their loved ones and doing things they actually enjoyed. As a disabled person, one of my biggest fears is being useless and compulsive productivity can sometimes quiet that fear but I'm even more terrified of wasting my life this way. And I'm glad I realized it at 23 rather than at 80. I know that many characters of Squid Game are victims of circumstances rather than hard workers addicted to success. It might be mind-boggling to think that people would willingly return to a game in which losers literally get murdered on the spot, but is this such an exaggerated metaphor after all? Over the last few decades, economic productivity has dramatically increased. We are working more than medieval serfs, all while earning less money than people in the 60s and 70s. In some first world countries, including the United States, life expectancy is starting to go down. Lifestyle-related diseases are an increasingly common cause of death, the GDP of countries is growing, but what are we getting out of it? Also, one more thing, this planet is not a video game. Reality is on cookie clicker. We will run out of resources at some point, and it's probably going to be sooner than you think. The harsh truth that many climate activists don't want to talk about is that even the modest Western lifestyle is not sustainable. And no, this doesn't mean that we have to do population control or abandon civilization and return to the savannah. It does, however, mean that we're doing too much of everything. We're working too much, buying too much, consuming too much, and not living enough. The solution to climate change is not to invent new green and sustainable ways to keep producing an enormous amount of stuff. We have to slow down. We have to stop and sit in uncomfortable silence and figure out what we actually want to do with our severely limited time on this planet. And it might be the most uncomfortable conversation we will ever have as a species. But hey, if the Squid Game became more popular than Bridgerton, perhaps there is some hope for humanity yet. Right, sorry, I think I have to go. See you on the other side. If you are still watching this, thank you so much for sticking around, I really appreciate it. The citations you are seeing on the screen can be found in the description along with links to some more videos. If you enjoy my work, the best way to support what I do is to feed the YouTube algorithm with likes, subscriptions and comments. You can also share the link with other people and follow me on social media. I have a coffee page if you want to leave a tip, though this is never an expectation or requirement. Not expecting 40 million dollars here, just enough to buy some hard-boiled eggs and makeup. Thank you again for watching, remember that life is ridiculously short and be ridiculously kind to yourself and others. Till the next one.